was your history within motorsports? I got started back in uh, 1988. And um, it was in desert racing with a guy named Ron Brandt. We just got out of high school, and uh, we used to go out and pre-run for him, and we'd help him chase and, and do different things. And it was, it was uh, Baja stuff. It was uh, super cool, super exciting. Back then, it was big. There was three and 400 entries per race. And um, that's probably what got me to fall in love with the sport and motorsports in general, was just seeing that excitement. And there's a sense of urgency in desert racing. And... Um, Conditions are constantly changing. It's super violent, but super crazy and, and, and very cool. Yeah. So what actually got you started in building cages and actually working with things? Um, we were poor. <laughs> Back in the 80s, when we were, we were chasing, there was a, Ron was in the unlimited class. We were wanting to enter, and they had a, a class 11, which is like, a, I mean, it's like spec me out of road racing. It's the bottom line. Um, kind of deal. So we built this class 11 bug. It was a 1969 um, IRS um, bug. And my dad was a uh, machinist and he was a welder and whatnot. And so we, we bought a little $300 tube blender and, and built the cage ourselves um, our first time. There was a kit back then. It was called class 11 roll cage kit. You could buy it through uh, like Summit Racing or those. And it was pre-bent for the Volkswagen. So we we got it, and we notched it, and fitted, and, and started doing that. And then as we progressed through the, the desert racing into the 90s, we built uh, more and more cages, and then pretty soon we started uh, started doing them. I volunteered a lot, actually, too, at a, a race shop. It had uh, Randy Anderson, uh, who was Walker Evans' guy, and uh, Russ Bernamont, and a couple other just amazing fabricators. And we volunteered. I used to sweep the floor, and then I got to where I could notch tubing, and then we were fern I would tack tubing, and then finally we got to where we were welding. So, awesome. yeah. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, where are some of your cages in motorsports now? Gosh, um, all over the world right now. I've got stuff, um, you know, obviously still in Baja. We still do some of that stuff. Uh, we've got um, some stuff in Paris to car. We built some two chassis uh, T3 cars. Um, Pikes Peak, we've got uh, some class wins there. Um, lots of rally cars. Out of the last 10 years, a lot of rally cars. Um, Rally America. I'm actually a NASA tech guy, so we do a lot of NASA, NASA cars as well. Um, road racing. We've got um, we've got a Ferrari that that runs at the Rolex, uh, the 24 Hours of Daytona. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, short track stuff, um, drag race stuff. Just about just about everything. Yeah, just about everywhere. That's actually really good to hear that you're one of the tech inspectors at NASA, because I know a lot of the problems people have had is getting. They're caged on by people and not passing tech based on the cage builder doing his own thing rather than following the rules or what he thinks might be better. Yeah, um, I should point out I'm, I'm on the rally side, not on the road racing side, but uh, it, it happens a lot. And, um, you know, there's so many different types of motorsports and cage builders and guys kind of get set in their ways and they, they do that. Fortunately, um, NASA and uh, SCCA Rally America, they're they've got a, a kind of a, a sort of conglomerate of rules and they're getting closer and closer together. So the goal is hopefully soon that you could race your car one weekend with Rally America and then the next weekend with NASA and then the next weekend go do SCCA and they would all be level across the board. There's a really cool trickle down effect. It, it, um, it, the superpowers in, in America are NASCAR and it's basically SCCA. They both have their, their pro road racing and rally and whatnot. NASCAR has Grand Am. SCCA has World Challenge, and they do a lot of testing up top when, uh, with sleds and different things, and that information trickles down. And I hate to say it, but a lot of the, the rules are written, they're just copy, paste, and cut right into the books. But it does come from some, some you know, pretty, pretty smart guys. So. Yeah, it's definitely something we see in, in our realm of time attack, is we see a lot of the, the copy and paste effect from SEC and SCCA and NASA is Though their old rules, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent, their old rules come and are implemented into into ours. As we spoke earlier, um, with the, the actual padding on the bars, as we said, with drifting, with top drift, they just implemented that rule this past year, and uh, it's starting to get into it. And then with time attack, I would assume very soon after, we're going to also see that trickle-down effect, as you explained, by getting that same roll bar padding needed to really protect people as well. Yeah, you guys need it too because you're going, I mean, you know, your lap times are, I mean, you guys are going crazy fast. I mean, you're really pushing the envelope. Our 
are pro teams in Rolex in the GT category, like the bodied cars, not the Daytona prototypes and whatnot, a lot of them are going in the low to mid 20s at Laguna Seca, and I believe you guys are starting to crack into the 20s, and those are three and four hundred thousand dollar cars. So, you guys need cage, you need padding, you need helmets, you need Hans devices, you need six point belts, you need fire systems, you need all that stuff because you are, I mean, you guys are pushing the envelope. So, going along that theme, yeah. what is something besides a cage that you also see that people don't use enough in a car safety? Um. Well, I, I really like fire systems, especially in forced induction cars. Uh, I, I like them in any, any, any racing situation because the drivers get knocked out a lot in the car and the car catches on fire and they wake up and it's, you know, it's really hot. Um, a two-pull system's great. You can get a course worker to run over and pull it on the fender for you. Um, I think handhelds are good too because a lot of times you, you pull your fire system and it dumps that first load and of course the turbo is still hot for quite a few minutes and that oil leak, you know, because you've thrown a rod through the block, it reignites. So having a second, you know, a second deal in there. So I, I don't want to burn. <laughs> <laughs> I think fire systems are, and they're, they're, they're affordable now. They're three or $400 for a system. You can do them yourself. Um, obviously fire extinguishers, should, I, I, Time Attack requires fire extinguishers, yeah? They don't even require them yet. Yeah, yeah every car, foundation. yeah, every car should hit mandatory have a, a, fire, a fire extinguisher minimum and most likely a fire system, especially forced induction. And what do you think is one of the greatest misconceptions people have about their track safety within their cars? Oh, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I, it, it's the simplest thing, but nobody ever plans on crashing. Nobody, nobody ever. It's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to me, and I'm upside down, and there's dirt in my car, and the windshields crack. What am I doing, and how did I get here? And we all make mistakes, and, it, and, and in road racing, it's it's just a quarter of a second of a mistake that causes the off, and you can't get it back. You just you just can't rewind and come back. So uh, you got to prepare for the worst, even though you you know you knock on wood that it it never happens. But um, yeah, yeah. The the misconception of it will never happen to me is something that I've heard and kind of seen in motorsports as a as a theme that it's all drivers. It won't happen to me. It will happen to someone else. I've said it. I, I've said it myself. We were racing you know, back in the mid '90s in Mickey Thompson in the stadiums. I think we were at uh, Qualcomm Stadium, and um, I, I looked at the tech inspector as I was about ready to go through the tunnel out into the arena, and he told me to do something. I was like, "Hey, it, I'm just going to take it easy out there. I'm, I'm just here. In fact, I'm going to drive this thing home." And he just kind of looked at me and shook his head. And, yeah, I, I've said it myself, but can't think that way. Hey.